Go. Good morning. Ah, thanks for coming to my session. This is on uh, PowerShell scripts to document various Citrix products. My name's Webster. I'm an independent consultant based out of Nashville, Tennessee, which is right dab smack in the almost in the middle of the U.S. And if you can't tell by the sound of my voice, Nashville, Tennessee is in peak allergy season. And after spending a, almost a week in London for Bryform, then a week in Anaheim, California for Synergy, I went home for three days, whoom, got hit right in the face with all this stuff. So I normally don't sound like I can sing bass, but uh, I can sing bass today. I've been a Citrix technology professional since 2010. Now, CTP does not stand for Citrix Trained Parrot. <laughs> So, I'm going to be honest with you and let you know when Citrix PowerShell stuff is good and when Citrix PowerShell stuff is just a pathetic piece of crap. Now, Gordon Payne, who one of the, one of the top dogs at Citrix, does not believe I actually criticize Citrix in public. And you will find out otherwise today. So, uh, as soon as Alex puts these videos up and allows me to uh, send out the link, Gordon Payne will be getting a link to this video so he can actually hear me criticize Citrix in public. I run the website carlwefter.com, otherwise known as the accidental Citrix admin, because believe me, if you ever find me being an administrator on your Citrix farm, that is purely an accident waiting to happen. And here's how you can find me, my email address, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can follow me, send me a connection request on LinkedIn, all that good stuff. I'm really hard to find because just about everything is Carl Webster. Now the agenda for today, we're going to cover the history of my scripts, the current scripts, what the scripts do and how, challenges faced, being faced, future of the current scripts, and future scripts. Now these are not discrete agenda items. All of these with my ADD and ADHD, they're all mixed together. So you're, it's all just a jumble. Now the history of the scripts actually starts with community support because I am not a PowerShell developer, I am not a PowerShell programmer, I am not a PowerShell guru, I am not a PowerShell geek. PowerShell does not come easy to me. I had to learn it the hard way and a lot of the books and stuff and articles and stuff I read on PowerShell go right over my head. In Tennessee, we call that being just a plain old goober, which means I'm just a plain, ordinary, nothing special, special about me guy. I had to learn PowerShell, so I just went in and got it and got the job done. But now, I could not have done this without a lot of major contributors. Some of these people have contributed functions uh, or big chunks of script uh, to use in the scripts. Uh, some of them, like Ryan Revor, Jeff Hicks, uh, have helped me majorly in uh, the most current versions of the scripts. And to me, the most helpful person for all the scripts, for all the iterations, is my friend, Exchange MVP, Michael B. Smith. Without him, none of these scripts would exist because he was very patient in helping me learn PowerShell and sometimes I have asked him the same question a thousand times because like I said this PowerShell stuff does not come easy to me so sometimes you have to beat me over the head as we say in Tennessee with a 2 by 4 for some of this stuff to sink in the other thing I need is I need lots of script testers there are lots of scripts now through all the various iterations uh, through all the various iterations, we're probably looking at anywhere between 20 and 25 scripts. So I've needed people from all over the world. I've needed people for small environments, medium environments, large environments, and extremely large environments to help me test all the stuff that's in these scripts. Some of these uh, script testers have really helped get the Tennessee language out of the scripts because I found out that I had a lot of running, getting, putting, and doing in there because in Tennessee we don't like using the letter G at the end of our words. Now next year you could be up here because I'm always looking 
for more contributors to the scripts and for more testers because there's a lot of uh, enhancement requests that I have been uh, asked for for these scripts and I can always use more help. Now, another thing, I may be from America, but these scripts are not USA centric. I've had people from all over the world help me with these scripts. And the countries that you're seeing, these are just the countries I knew because I knew someone was from a country or I could tell by their email address. If they were using Gmail or Hotmail or something like that, if I didn't know the individual, I wouldn't know what country they were from. And so I believe there's uh, 17 or uh, 21 countries uh, listed here. So I've had people from all over the world help. And it's been very important. Now, you ready for this? Did you know at once, one time, I was a professional tuba player? How do you like that picture? <laughs> That's from spring of 1977 when I was all of 20 years old. And I was going to make all my money being a professional tuba player. <laughs> and how do you like that hair? How do you like that beard? I tell you what, Jim Moyle, Stefan Therion, man, they ain't got nothing on me when it comes to hair or beard. And my sister, my kid sister, actually has the one picture that exists of me when my hair was actually down past my shoulders. But she won't give me the picture because she's afraid I will destroy it because of how I look in the picture. And like most musicians, I had to find a way to actually pay the bills. So that picture was taken in spring of 1977. In September of 1977, long before most of y'all were even born, I got into IT. Got started in mainframes and then evolved into doing accounting software. Then evolved into doing uh, Novell Networks. At one time, uh, I helped install and manage over 650 Novell Networks across the United States. And then in July 2001, moved into Active Directory and started doing everything with Active Directory. And then I started doing a lot of projects for a lot of companies all over the world, from the smallest companies all the way to some of the largest enterprises in the world, doing 80 migrations, 80 troubleshooting, Exchange, SharePoint, stuff like that. And then uh, Krista Anderson, Kristen Griffin, and my friend Michael B. Smith started encouraging me to write. And this is probably around 2004. They started encouraging me to write about all my experiences. Well, finally, I decided to get off my butt in uh, 2008. So it only took me four years to decide to actually write. And I went to my very first uh, Citrix conference, which was a Tech Edge at, uh, in Orlando, Florida, October 2008. And I met Joe Harder there. And I said, Joe, I'm looking at... Uh, doing some writing. Uh, there's a ton of websites out there for Active Directory, a lot of stuff for Exchange, a lot of stuff for SharePoint. And yeah, there's some stuff out there for Citrix, but there's no website that really helps those of us who are actually accidental admins. You know, I've done around 200 Citrix farms prior to 2008, but all of them were like, you know, one, two, three server farms. Very simple. But I'm an Active Directory guy. I just do Citrix because, well, that's, you know, I worked with the original Citrix product back in early 1990, multi-user OS2. And all of a sudden people see that on your resume and they say, oh, you know everything about Citrix, so you do all of our Citrix stuff. And so I talked to Joe and Joe said, yeah, that sounds really good. So finally, in November 2008, the initial CarlWebster.com Accidental Citrix Admin was released. And I started out this website basically to learn more about Zenapp and Citrix products. Because I was no Citrix expert. I figure if I could write about Citrix or Zenapp um, to the point to where someone who knew absolutely nothing about the product and had never seen it could they follow my articles and actually install Zenapp and web interface and CSG and all that stuff, publish applications? Could they actually do that for my articles? I figure if I could do that, 
then I must really be able to understand the Citrix stuff. And that's why the accidental Citrix admin was born. So I kept writing and kept writing, and then I started answering questions on Experts Exchange. I've answered around 2,000 questions on Experts Exchange. A lot of the articles on my website are me helping people uh, with their questions they've asked on Experts Exchange. And sometimes you can't answer questions in one or two sentences. Sometimes you need uh, lengthy, very detailed, step-by-step -step instructions. And then in April 2010, I was honored uh, to be selected as a Citrix Technology Professional. And then in February 2011, I decided to go out on my own. And my very first customer was a large drugstore in the U.S. with over 8,000 stores in U.S. and Puerto Rico, and uh, also Guam. Obviously, as you can tell, I'm not allowed to use their name, but uh, you may be able to tell by the W up there who they actually are. Just don't say their name in public, please. Um, well, what they had is they had a Zenet 5 2003 environment that was very unstable. They had a lot of servers, and they were having to reboot every server in that Zenet 5 farm four to eight times every day. It was so unstable. And so they hired me to come in there on a 12-week project to stabilize the environment. And it's amazing what you can fix when you actually look in event logs on servers. Because servers are screaming at you in event logs, trying to tell you what's wrong with them. So after nine weeks, we actually had it where we were just down to one weekly reboot. And they wanted that scheduled because they had some really bad uh, applications uh, that just ate up memory, so we had to reboot every week. And then, after nine weeks, finished the project. And they said, hey, we've got three weeks left, so we want you to stay and just show up every day. And if someone has a question, you can answer the question. Otherwise, just be there. So I said, okay. And uh, <laughs> so then they said, oh, hey, by the way, we don't have any documentation on this environment. So, so while you're just sitting around for three days, what we'd like for you to do is to go through the delivery services console, document everything there, document all the farm properties, and because more than half the servers don't use farm properties, we need all the server properties. And we need as much as you can get out of the advanced configuration console. And we want all of our policy settings for their 180 Citrix policies. So I was like, no problem. <laughs> Hung up the phone. Uh, oh crap. How do you do that? Like I said, I wasn't a Citrix person. But uh, from my work on Exchange, I knew that Microsoft had this product called PowerShell. I knew how to spell PowerShell. And I was like, didn't I read somewhere or see something where Citrix had some PowerShell stuff for ZenApp? So I just Googled PowerShell, ZenApp, Document a Farm, and came across Michael Bogobovitz's article, and which just showed that, hey, you can do stuff like get XA Farm, get XA Application, get XA Server, and actually get information about the ZenApp environment. Of course, I had to learn. I was just like, but don't I want multiple servers? in multiple applications, in multiple administrators. So I had to learn, you know, that, well, everything in PowerShell is supposed to be singular. So once I got through all of that, then I was just like, okay, but is there anything out there for ZenApp 5? This is ZenApp 6. So I found this, that, oh yeah, there is stuff out there for ZenApp 5. So I went out there and started uh, playing around with the stuff, just doing get XA farm, get XA server, get XA application, get XA administrator, because for Zen App 5 and Zen App 6, Citrix actually did a good job with PowerShell. You could actually do things to me that made sense. And so I started playing around with the stuff, and then they had also asked for information on the servers. So I was just like, well, how do you get information on the servers? So I Googled. And I found someone that had some PowerShell stuff on how to get WMI information on the servers. And that's when I had my first oops. 
You really shouldn't run code you copy off the internet on a production farm. <laughs> Because I found out the hard way that whosoever WMI stuff I got wasn't very good because every Zenapp server, as it went through that script and started getting the WMI information, crashed the server. Every single server in the farm during production hours. That was not fun. Then I've also run into things like, uh, what were they thinking? You know, it's, it's just like, take this very first one here. You know, farm properties, connection access control, should be pretty simple. It's only got three settings. So you look at the stuff, uh, the, the stuff in PowerShell, and you got the allow any connections equals any connections. Okay, what about allow one type only? So you would think, well, allow one type only, well, that's got to be Citrix access gateway connections only because that's the one that has one, right? <laughs> it's the one that has three. And the one that says allow multiple types, <laughs> and so you're thinking, huh? And then you've also got the thing where if you disable something, you've actually enabled the checkbox. So if you have disabled something, PowerShell actually returns the fact that it's enabled. So if it's disabled, it's enabled. If it's dis enabled, it's then disabled. So that's almost the same as you get with a lot of Microsoft group policy. You enable something to disable, you disable something to enable. So once I had to get through all of that stuff, then eventually, because remember, I've only got three weeks. i got three weeks to learn PowerShell and figure out how to get all the stuff from all the consoles in the order that it appears in the console, using the wording that's in the consoles, into a document I can submit to the customer for their approval before I leave. So... The very first script, and here's the output from it. But I still had to take this file, open it up into Word, add a cover page, add a table of contents, add page numbers, add footers, go through, add all my heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, mainly go through there and separate all the farm stuff from the configuration logging stuff from the administrators, from the server, from the applications, and so on and so forth. Still hours of manual work to do on a large farm. But that's all I could learn to do in three weeks time. But I got it done and the customer must have liked it because they gave me a really good recommendation on LinkedIn. So that's the very first script. April of 2011 was when this script was actually completed. Then in September 2011 I had a customer uh, contracted me to get them off of a very botched Zen Desktop 5 implementation and move them to Zen App 6 because they wanted Zen App 6 for some reason. And he said, by the way, could you leave us some documentation on all the servers and stuff? And I was like, yes, paid to write a script. So that's pretty cool. So then, believe it or not, I had absolutely no intentions of ever releasing these scripts because I was like, I'm just little old Webster from Tullahoma, Tennessee. Who in the world would find these scripts useful? And besides that, when you release script code on the internet, man, people will shred you apart because of your code. Because they're going to say, oh, that's bad code. Oh, that's ugly code. Oh, you should have done it this way. Oh, you should have done it that way. And you get your little feelings hurt. So actually, I had never intended to release these. But, as usual, Jari and Gibson had to talk me into releasing these. So, the Zenapp 6 script was released first on September 30, 2011. And then, uh, in October 2011, I got hired to do my first Zenapp 6.5 implementation. And the customer said, oh, by the way, when you're finished, could you leave us some documentation on all of this Zenapp 6.5 environment? And I was like... Yes! Paid to write another script. And while I'm writing that script, I turn around and release the Zenet 5 script. And then a couple of days later, release the Zenet 6.5 script. And then in March 2012, I get hired by a fellow CTP to do a three-week project uh, for a very large home improvement retail operation in the United States. I walk in the door, and they start introducing me. And they say, Hey, you're Carl Webster. Aren't you that 
accidental Citrix admin guy? I was like, yeah, yeah. And they go, don't you have documentation scripts? And I was like, yeah, you got anything for Zen Desktop? No. And they go, well, we got a Zen Desktop 4 farm. While you're here, could you document that? I was like, yes, paid to write another script. Now, for Zen App 5, Zen App 6, Zen App 6, 5, and Zen Desktop 4, Citrix did a really good job with the PowerShell. Because you could get XA Farm, you could get XD Farm, you could get XD Broker, get XA, you know, whatever. Everything was nice and neat in the way it should be in PowerShell. And then, after I get the Zen Desktop 4 script done, they go, hey, by the way, we've got a PVS 5.6 and a PVS 6.0 and PVS 6.1 farms. Could you leave us some documentation on those? I was like, ugh, paid to write another script. And I was like, sweet, until I started looking at that pathetic piece of crap that is PVS PowerShell. So Gordon Payne, I said it. <laughs> so, I finally figure out that beyond pathetic and crap, it's also horrible and miserable. So I had to figure out that the PVS stuff is actually just an array of strings. There's no objects. So I had to write a function because the guy from Citrix hadn't written his function yet to actually get all the PVS stuff into objects. So I wrote a function to do that and got everything done. And then along the way, um, I learned uh, by that time from uh, April of 2011 to March 2012, I'd actually uh, learned some more PowerShell. I actually learned the switch statement which allowed me to get a better output for the PVS script. And then I was able to then take that and put it into the other scripts. What amazes me is how popular these scripts are. I never thought anyone would find these scripts usable. And before uh, Bryform, Synergy, and E2E, uh, Jim Moyle, Benny Trish, and uh, Jordan Gibson were saying, are you going to do anything? about your PowerShell scripts for any presentations for conferences. So I was just like, who in the world wants to hear me talk about my PowerShell scripts? Oh no, you gotta do it, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. So I did it. And then I found out about this thing, uh, ego searching, putting your name into uh, Google. And so I started searching Carl Webster documentation scripts. Absolutely blew me away. I literally spent the next four hours looking at all these sites that talked about my documentation scripts and people who linked to them on Experts Exchange, the Citrix Support Forums, and many other places. And honestly, I was blown away. I had no idea that many people were using my scripts. And so I actually then went back and looked at all my Google Analytics stuff to figure out, well, how many people have actually downloaded these scripts. Well, the Zen Desktop 4 and all these numbers are about three weeks old now. Uh, Zen Desktop 4 has been downloaded roughly 2,000 times. PVS 5,000. Zen App 5, 7,000. Zen App 6, 9,000. And the one that blows me away, Zen App 6, 5 has been downloaded over 27,000 times. <laughs> so roughly, the scripts have been downloaded 50,000 times. Now, there are a number of sites out there that are afraid I'm going to take away the, the scripts or start charging for the scripts. And I've been told I should charge for the scripts, but I'm not going to because there's so many community contributions to the scripts. How would I pay all these people who have contributed code to the scripts? So as far as I'm concerned, the scripts will always be available and will always be free. So let's take the Zenap 6.5 script and let's look at the evolution of the scripts. So here's the very first Zenap 6.5 script based strictly off what I did on the original Zenap 5 script. You notice everything just kind of all looks together and then we've got fields in there that uh, or lines that have absolutely no values. Uh, you've got uh, like the um, this line that has both the product in the addition on one line, and then for ZenApp 6 and ZenApp 6.5, the operating system type can only be 64-bit. But I can see that useful for ZenApp 5, but ZenApp 6, 6.5, nah. And then, as you can see, before I learned the switch statement, uh, all I could do was just print what the PowerShell commandlets returned to me. 
And then in January of this year, uh, I finally got around to taking all the stuff I had learned doing the PBS script back in April uh, 2012 and actually putting that into the scripts. And so I cleaned up uh, the output some, uh, separated the product and edition, uh, all the lines that didn't return anything, I just removed them from the script because of all the sample reports that have been sent to me, none of them ever returned anything, so to me, just taking up space. And then you'll see now, for logins in like the election preference, I actually uh, go through and give you the information that's actually in the console. And then, when I did the Zenapp 6 script in September 2011, and then I released it, uh, there was a guy, Ryan Revord, that then took the script and said, hey, do you mind if I take this and generate a Word document? And I was like, no, nah, not at all. I'd like to know how to do that. So he took it, and then in November, he emailed me the file, and then finally, in January 2013, I actually looked at what he had sent me back in November of 2011. <laughs> and I was just like, hey, this actually does create a basic Word document, but not good enough because I want a cover page, I want a table of contents, I want page numbers, footers, I want all the headings and stuff like that. And so then I found Jeff Hicks's information uh, from a PowerShell thing he had done uh, in 2012 in San Diego and he actually showed how to do cover page, table of contents, stuff like that. And so uh, just a little bit uh, Probably less than uh, two weeks later, I then came out with the version 3 scripts that created Word documents. So we have our nice cover page and a table of contents and uh, a table uh, for the Citrix services. And one thing I could not figure out how to do was how do you get that table to align with the text above it. And then another thing, how do I get multiple tables in one section? I couldn't figure that out. And so finally, uh, just a couple of uh, weeks later, I had posted uh, a question on a website uh, asking, well, how do you move a table over and how do you get multiple tables in one section of a Word document? And a guy told me how to move the table, and, but he won't let me use his name or give him credit or anything, so it's uh, some anonymous guy, and it actually worked. I was able to get the table moved over. And once I figured that out, I was able to look at his code and actually figure out how to get multiple tables in one section. So that was pretty exciting for me. So what do the scripts do? So again, we're going to use the most popular script, the Zenet 6.5 version 3.1 script. So you're going to find the scripts just by going to my website. There's a sticky, so the information on how to find the scripts is always at the top of the home page. So you just click on that. And then you'll browse down for this example, we're going to browse down to version 3.1, Zenap 6.5, because right now, currently, all the script versions are in this document, but the most current scripts are listed at the top and the older scripts are listed at the bottom. And you'll see that we have signed and unsigned scripts because there are some enterprises that do not allow unsigned scripts to run. And so... Uh, DigiCert is very kind to the CTPs and they give us uh, free uh, certificates and they actually gave me a code signing certificate which is not cheap. So thank you very much DigiCert. And then I'll offer the files in both PS1 and TXT extensions because some uh, companies block all script files. So if you try to download a PS1 file off the internet, it's blocked. So I had to do the TXT, and then there's also a README file with all the instructions. List all the prerequisites, what to download, how to install, what you need to uh, create if you're using configuration logging, so the script knows how to connect to the configuration logging database and get you the information out of it. And then it then shows you how to run the script, and for this it has all four versions of the Zenap 6.5 script. So what does the script do? My philosophy has always been to go through each of the consoles and just go through everything in the order that it appears except for policies. And then 
We go through, and then we'll come back and do policies. The only reason I do policies last is because there is more code to get the policies than in all the other sections combined. So I knew that was going to be a lot of typing, so I did policies last. And the policies appear last in the report also, and no one has ever complained about policies being last on the report. And then we'll also uh, get you the configuration logging database configuration information. Now getting the script ready to run, you can just type the name of the script and press enter and offer to go. Because we go out there and grab uh, defaults for username, company name, uh, cover page. But if you're a consulting company, you could use your name for the username, put your customer's name for the company name, put a nice cover page. I like cubicles, mainly because it uses all the fields for the cover pages. And then I always recommend that you run the scripts with dash for both. Not because I spent a lot of hours putting in about 250 lines of right verbose statements, but it also lets you know that the script is actually doing something because in very large environments, this script can run for hours. Uh, one of my testers sent me the results from his environment. They have 1,225 servers, 5,000 published applications, 1,200 published desktops, lots of policies, worker groups, all that stuff. Uh, the script generated over 300 pages of a Word document and ran for right at three hours. The PVS, the latest PVS script, uh, I ran at a customer site in a production environment from my uh, Zen Desktop 5.6 Win 7X 64 VM with all of 2 gig of RAM and running it against their environment with 869 target devices and five PVS servers, one farm, one site, uh, some views, and I think uh, eight VDisc and 10 uh, devices. It generated about 452 pages and ran for two hours and 51 minutes. Now, because I ran it, I was able to monitor uh, the CPU usage and the memory usage. And so the WinWord process never went above like 10 to 15 percent CPU usage and WinWord never used more than 75 mega RAM. Uh, the PowerShell process never went above 40 percent CPU. So the scripts really don't use that much in terms of resources on the computer running the script. So now when the script runs, now just sit back, this is going to be the most exciting 16 hours, or no, 16 seconds that you're going to have in the E2E -E conference. So when we go to run the script, isn't this exciting? Watching a PowerShell script run. <laughs> now when I get back uh, home, I'm actually going to add more right verbose statements because in very large environments when this script runs for hours, there's still not enough right verbose statements. So once the script finishes, we get our cover page, we get our table of contents, which I, when I ran the PVS script at that customer site, I didn't like the table of contents, mainly because the table of contents was 89 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> and all this stuff about whatever, name, colon, and all that stuff, to me that's not table of contenty. So I cleaned that up and fixed that for the PVS script, and I'm going to go in and add that in for the Zenap 5, 6, and 6.5 script and clean up the table of contents. And then we show you the configuration logging. Uh, the useful thing about this, it actually shows you all the information and also what account uh, is used to uh, connect to the config logging database. Uh, then we have administrators, and if you have a lot of custom administrators, like a lot of people do, this allows you to see all the various permissions for all your custom administrators. And then applications, all nice and neat. And then your history report, which is actually the configuration logging report. Uh, load evaluators. And then servers. Now, when I was originally creating this script for the Zenet 5 version, because uh, in Zenet 5, you can have servers that don't use farm settings. And I noticed when I was doing this report that they had a lot of servers that had different product additions. I mean, they had advanced, enterprise, and platinum. They were all using different license servers. 
And when I asked the customer about this, they were like, oh, yeah, we changed all that over a year ago and we didn't know which servers were using what. So I wrote a script that you can find on my website, Finding Mismatched Servers, which for Zenat 5 goes out there and you tell it what license server and what addition all the servers should be using. It goes out there and finds all the mismatched ones. If you're a Trekkie, you really want to look at that article because the help text for that script has a lot of Star Trek references in it. <laughs> and then in servers, uh, again, we have a table. Now, one of the enhancements I've been asked for is to take all the stopped services and then also for the hot fixes, all the uninstalled or not installed hot fixes, and make them stand out. Well, there's a problem with using things like yellow text or red text because there are people like me who are very colorblind. And the guy I was working with on the project uh, for the, where I was running the PBS script, he can't see red. So if you use red text on a white background, he sees nothing. <laughs> and yellow text on a white background, to me, is unreadable. Same thing with green text on a white background totally unreadable. So when you make enhancements or changes to the scripts where people ask for colors, you should always keep in mind that IT is mainly made up of guys. And guys are colorblind. <laughs> and there are some of us who can't see colors. Now, so what I found out in doing a uh, Zen Desktop 5 uh, script uh, to get the <coughs> Um, PVD uh, status uh, information is I found out that if I used red or yellow backgrounds that even those of us who are colorblind we may not be able to see that it's red or yellow but we know that something is different about that cell so Gordon Payne tell Citrix they should look at us green gray colorblind people and stop using so much green all right, and then uh, there's the uh, other tables, and I'll put the all not installed in red. And then you'll get uh, the zone information. And in the zones, you can see what's most preferred, preferred, not preferred, default, and which of your servers are in worker mode. And then last but not least, all the policies. So what was the most difficult thing to do for all the scripts? Session printers were the devil. Zen F65 session printers were the worst because we got this dialog box with three tabs and all kinds of drop downs and things you can fill in and all that stuff. And you know what made them so difficult? No documentation from Citrix. Thank you very much, Citrix. <laughs> and then Citrix actually has this thing where they uh, went and documented all the policy settings, uh, what they call their enum types. Uh, do you see a session printer data type or enum type? No, nope, you don't, because it's not there, because Citrix didn't bother to document it. Thank you very much, Citrix. So, before I got them figured out, this was all I could do. I could tell you a session printers were enabled or disabled, and that was it. And then, this is what it looks like after I got everything figured out. And yes, I had to manually type all that in because there was no documentation from Citrix to do any cut and, or copy and paste for. So I had to figure all this out and manually type in all this stuff. So the session printers in Zen F65 were from four lines of PowerShell to 328 lines. And to make it even worse, Zen F5, Zen F6 were completely different, even though they look the same. So there's Zen F5, there's Zen F6. Do you see the difference? Oh, but Citrix made the PowerShell for the two completely different. So how did I figure out session printers? Well, first I created a user policy for session printers with no printers and looked at the results. And I can see, okay, there are session printers, not configured. Okay, I got that much. Then I went there and added two printers. I wanted two printers because I wanted a printer I could modify and a printer I would leave alone so that I could make sure that what I did didn't affect the other one and the documentation would be correct. So I then reran my little script and there we go. Okay, now it's enabled. 
and I got values equals it, but then I'm looking like there's value, 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 value. Why is session printers values? Isn't everything in PowerShell supposed to be singular? So that's another one of them head scratchers. And then of course I get, okay, values equals system dot object. What the heck is system dot object? So then I remembered, Brandon Shell beat me about the head about this. It says, okay, if you don't understand something, what you do is you just uh, assign a variable to something. So I knew that that's how to get the uh, group policy stuff and my session printer policy name. And then I knew that the variable was session printers, not values. And so Brandon said, okay, you just pipe it to get member. And so I did that. And then I came down here and said, oh, okay, there's a get type. Okay, for some of you that may be obvious. For me, that wasn't that obvious. So then, I go, oh, uh, get type. It's an array. Oh, okay. Well, once I figured that out, I then was able to figure out the other 10 policy settings that I could not figure out because they were also arrays. And doing the session printers and these other 10 settings added almost 1,000 lines of code just to the policy section. Mainly because none of these are documented by Citrix, so I had to figure them out. And so now that I knew it was an array, I just wrote me a little script that just goes out there and you know looks in the array and just writes to the screen its value. And then I go, oh, okay, all right, there are my two printers. Oh, okay, it's an array of arrays. Each item in the array is actually another array. And so then I knew that I had to split out uh, the in array from the out array and then also I had to figure out how to get my server and share name. And then you go and you make one change to one printer, run the little script to see what the result is and I see that when I go to 600 DPI that print quality is now a negative three. And then you go and you change print quality to 1200. 300, 150, and then you see that there are all the values, and then you have to rinse, leather, repeat until every single option on all three tabs has been set. <laughs> and as these options change, you got to run the little script to see what the value was changed to, but since Citrix didn't document any of them. And there's a cut down version of the settings. And that's all there was to figuring out the 142 undocumented session printer settings. Thank you very much, Citrix. <laughs> <laughs> then I had to go through the exact same process for both Zenap 6 and Zenap 5, because I figured, well, Zenap 6 and Zenap 6.5, they use the same, you know, citrix.grouppolicy.commands module. So I just copied all the stuff from Zenap 6.5 script, put it in Zenap 6, ran it, barf, everywhere. So I had to redo all the Zenap 6. And I said, okay, well, Zenap 6 and Zenap 5, they got the same session printer stuff. Copy all the stuff from Zenap 6, put it in Zenap 5, barf. Nope. Had to figure it all over again because Citrix didn't document any of that. Now, some of the challenges I ran into were because there's a mole from Citrix marketing in the Zenap product team. Citrix cannot keep names the same or location is the same. This is Zen at 5 2003, Zen at 5 2008, different names, different locations, different indentation levels, because remember my goal? Put everything in the exact order that it appears. And Citrix changed everything from Zen at 5 2003 to Zen at 5 2008. Same thing for the server properties. Just Citrix marketing has their tattoo all over this. Same thing, policy comparison. Look at that. It's the same product, Zen at 5. <laughs> and then all this <laughs> stuff. And that was just the first half of the policies. There we go. What they say when, when they talk to you. <laughs> I hope Citrix fixes some of their stuff. Okay. And get that Citrix marketing mo out of product development. I got just a minute to go, so let me get finished here. And you would figure Zenap 6 and 6.5 are pretty close. Nah, they add stuff. They remove stuff. 
they completely changed names. Here we got HDX Media Stream. Here we got Windows Media Redirection. Multimedia Conference is last over here, but it's first over there. We got new stuff, stuff that's been added, stuff that didn't exist in Zen 6, and of course all that stuff has to be accounted for. So, that's why there's a separate Zen 6 and 6.5 script because of all of these differences. And so many people run mixed mode Zen 5 farms that I, I can... I have to have one Zenat 5 script. Why people run mixed mode Zenat 5 farms is beyond me. <laughs> and then the user policy differences. I mean, it's just red everywhere. So, future of the current scripts. I've been asked to gather information on all the applications installed on the Zenat servers. Not just published, but installed. But that's not easy. You install Microsoft Office, you get a ton of applications, not just Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook. So what do you want me to return? Add hardware information. Do you remember my story about WMI and getting hardware information on servers? Whoo! But I bought a book, PowerShell and WMI. I'll see if there's a way I can actually do it better. Create an online file for CTX129229, the recommended hot fixes for ZenF6 and above. Well, a lot of places don't have internet access from the computers running these scripts. So how would they get this? So if I've got to update the script and update this, why would I do two things? I'll just do one. I'll just update the script. Add an appendix for ZenF server to show major items like addition, model, license server so that people can actually see that so they can spot any differences. And then the same thing for the applications. And for here, I would put just things that would affect session sharing, encryption level, resolution, color desk, stuff like that, so people can see the differences in published applications. And then also for PVS servers to show the advanced settings in a table because you want all your PVS servers to be configured the same. Future scripts, NetScaler, PVS 7 or 6.2 or whatever they're going to call it. Storefront, yes. I will add a storefront script once storefront is usable. <laughs> Zen Desktop 5, Zen Desktop 7. Now, unfortunately, Zen Desktop 7 is based on the same pathetic, crappy PowerShell that Zen Desktop 5 is based on. But there are so many new things in Zen Desktop 7, they will have to be two separate scripts. And then Zen Server, which is also based on a pathetic, crappy PowerShell implementation. So, who wants Netscaler done next? PBS 7? And Storefront? Boom. <laughs> Zen Desktop 5? Wow. Zen Desktop 7? Okay. And <clears throat> Zen Server. <laughs> Netscaler is going to be a challenge. Any questions in the couple of seconds I got remaining? Outside. All right. <laughs> and suggestions or comments, you can get to me while I'm here. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, shirts that if you want to come up and get a, a shirt, come get it. Thank you very much. <laughs>